So this week's topic is science and empire. And I think the best way into this question is actually by looking at the readings for this week, which is uh, Bala's chapter six, where he asks this question, what made the Renaissance in Europe? So uh, in the last few chapters, Bala has been setting us up for his argument. At this point, he's actually delivering the argument. He's actually delivering what he thinks is the evidence for his dialogical picture of science. So what led to the Renaissance? The Renaissance in Europe. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Renaissance, a very uh, broad historical time period would be 1300 to 1600 or something like that. Some people draw the uh, historical boundaries a little more narrowly than that. Um, but let's say 1300 to 1600, something like that, Europe underwent this profound political, social, intellectual transformation. Things really changed a lot in Europe. Uh, I think the easiest way to see that is to look at the art. So here's what really good art looked like in the 1200s in Europe. Um, this is uh, the Virgin Mary and Jesus. Jesus looking like a little, just a shrunken person, just a, just a full grown man made small. Uh, and then 200 years later, art looks like this, which uh, looks like something that would have been produced today. So you see some perspective in here. It's got depth. It's got uh, it's got much more realism. So something really changed in these 200 years. Something about the way people were seeing the world literally changes. So um, we we get profound scientific changes as well. So this is the period in which heliocentrism is introduced. We'll talk about that again next week. Um, but like Copernicus's theory that. The earth goes around the sun rather than the sun going around the earth gets introduced in this period. We see profound technological changes. So following along with our theme of information technology, you see Gutenberg's printing press get introduced in Europe in this period. Uh, so like a lot of stuff is going on. A lot of stuff is going on. And the standard story about the Renaissance that of course Bala is going to kind of try to resist and complexify is that essentially what was happening is Europe was rediscovering its ancient Greek heritage. So ancient Greece was famous for things like free inquiry, uh, open debate, um, the, the kind of exploration of ideas. Um, so, and that's all, that's all true. It was a society like that. Um, they're, so they're not wrong about the fact that ancient Greek ideas and attitudes were being rediscovered in Europe at this time. It just leaves out quite a lot. So uh, another part of the standard story about the Renaissance is that it was in some sense precipitated by the Black Death. This is one of the worst, if not the worst plague humans have ever faced. Um, it swept through Asia, Europe, and parts of Africa in the kind of mid 1300s. And somewhere between, estimates vary, but somewhere between 30 and 60% of the entire population of Europe died from the Black Death. So just an enormous earth-shaking, society-changing uh, sort of a biological event. And for the kind of society it was, I mean, I mean, losing half your population really makes you think about stuff I and mean, really makes you reflect on your place in the world. Uh, but also if it's uh, an economy that's fundamentally based on agriculture, um, you just lost half of your productive workforce as well. So um, in medieval Europe, it was standard for nobility to own the land and then for peasants to work the land. And nobility got rich because they sort of got to take some of the productivity of the land and the peasants. So the peasants have just had their numbers split by half. There's the same amount of land. So there's this enormous labor shortage. And this encourages people, the standard story, and Bala agrees, this encourages people to look for more efficient technologies to work the land. It encourages the peasants to sort of move around more, to look for better work opportunities. Uh, so it really kind of shakes up society on all levels. So those are bits. So the, the revival of ancient Greek thinking and the shakeup of society by the Black Death are parts of the story that kind of everybody agrees are parts of the story. 
but in his usual style, Bala would like us to expand our view a little bit more. He thinks those are important, but not, by no means the only factors that were important in bringing about the Renaissance in Europe. Um, the, the crudest version of the story that Ball is fighting against could be summed up in, in this chart, which was uh, very frequently passed around the kind of new atheist circles on the internet back when those were in their kind of heyday. I don't know if any of you experienced that period, but it was a, it was a very smug time on the internet. Um, but they would, they would pass around this chart. I mean, the implication being that the rise of Christianity, so after the Rome fell, the rise of Christianity left a, an enormous gap in the, in the kind of intellectual tradition. So for one thing, uh, as should be clear already and will continue to become clearer as we talk, um, the dark, the so-called Dark Ages in Europe were a bad time in Europe. Nobody argues that they were like really great and prosperous. People were, generally speaking, poor. Uh, they didn't, they were, uh, there was high illiteracy. Uh, so society kind of took a tumble in Europe for, for this period, it really did. But places like India, China, we're doing just fine, thank you very much, in terms of their economic and technological development. So for one thing, this chart really only pays attention to Europe. Everywhere else in the world, things were chugging along pretty nicely. Um, but Bala thinks that this story that we have about the Dark Ages actually has a kind of motivation. And to understand that motivation, you need to understand a little bit about the relationship between Europe and particularly the Islamic world during this period. So. I'll quote a little bit of Bala from page 62, so from the Dialogue of Civilizations, Birth of Modern Science. Bala says that he specs, quote, the narrative of a dark age in Europe, with its mythology of heritage lost and found, was only created in order to avoid the charge, a highly incendiary charge, one, given the struggle of Europe against Arab Muslim colonization in the medieval era, that the translation of Arabic texts involved the transmission of Arabic philosophy into science in Europe. Okay, what does he mean by that? Uh, we're gonna, let's get into that. So let me, let me explain what he means by that and why this is essentially, he's saying, a story that medieval Europe, or, or sorry, Renaissance Europeans told themselves about where their heritage was coming from, where this sort of revival of thought and philosophy and science was coming from during the Renaissance. Okay, so um, let me just give you a couple examples. This one is from the chapter that's reading this week, uh, Pope Sylvester II. Uh, here you see an image of Pope Sylvester uh, consorting with the devil uh, because, of course, he was a dark wizard who had gone to nefarious places to study the dark arts. Uh, or at least that's how he was depicted in about the 1400s. So during the kind of... Uh, for some people, middle or the beginning of the Renaissance, people saw this guy as very, very suspect. Um, now, in reality, he was not a dark wizard. He was just a guy who was born to fairly poor French parents in 946. Uh, he went to get, be educated at the local monastery, which was, at the time was the kind of place you got an education. You got an education through the church. And he impressed his teachers enough that they shipped him off to Spain. And Spain was a place that you could get a better education than in France, because Spain, although it had been under the control of Christians for about 100 years, still had access to uh, Muslim or Islamic learning that had been collected there for, uh, for a couple of centuries when the Islamic caliphates controlled it. So Spain was a point at which... Uh, it went back and forth between being run by the Islamic world, being run by the European world, and there was a kind of leftover collection of knowledge from when it was run by the Islamic world that Pope Sylvester, born Gerbert de Aurillac, uh, got to learn about. He got to learn about fun stuff like the abacus. So at the time, Europeans were writing down Roman numerals, which is a really terrible way of doing math. It's super slow and frustrating. Um, the abacus vastly improves your speed of calculation. Um, now, 
Europeans, in the sense of ancient Greeks and Romans, had known about the abacus. It was extremely widespread in the ancient world. It was well known in ancient India, in ancient China, in Mesopotamia. So the abacus has been around for quite some time. Um, it had been forgotten in Europe for quite a while. So for several centuries, they had lost the art of the abacus. Um, but Pope Sylvester II brings it back, and therefore they think he's consorting with the devil. So you can see the sort of attitude between uh, the Europeans and the Islamic learning that they're kind of, or the Islamic world that they're in some sense getting information from. Um, also in this period, so another factor that Bala cites is the uh, rise of universities in Europe. So remember I just told you that Sylvester was uh, educated in a monastery. The standard place to get an education was through the church. Um, but here's a, here's a picture of the University of Naples, established in 1224. Uh, and these universities were being fed on a kind of steady diet of translations into Latin, typically, but European languages from Arabic. And uh, they are semi-autonomous from the church. Okay, so... Uh, the University of Naples was founded by this guy, Frederick II. He's my absolute favorite medieval European king or ruler. He crowned himself the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, but it's not clear that there was such a thing as the Roman Western Roman Empire at this point. Um, but I like him because he was he managed to get excommunicated by the church four times. They kicked him out of the church four times. Um, one of them was for uh, not going on a crusade. So during this period, there's a lot of fighting going on between the uh, Christian and the Islamic world. Uh, the Christians keep going forth on crusade. So they'd like gather up a bunch of knights and they'd go to try to take over a city or kill a bunch of people in the Islamic world. Particularly, they were interested in getting a hold of Jerusalem and Bethlehem because these were of religious significance to them. So one time he gets excommunicated for procrastinating, not going on a crusade when he was told to, so not gathering up a bunch of his knights and going uh, going on a crusade. Uh, he eventually does gather up a bunch of knights and goes on a crusade, but uh, doesn't ask the church for permission first, and they excommunicate him again for that. Um, and they particularly didn't like the way that he fought his crusades. So this is a picture of Frederick II uh, having a conversation, gasp, with one of the Muslim rulers. So the, the uh, Al-Kamil was a sultan, and he, Frederick II, had the extremely poor taste to sit down with this guy and convince him, using just words, not a bloody siege or mass slaughter, as was standard at the time, convinced him, using just his words, to uh, give him Bethlehem and Jerusalem which was actually the point of the Crusades all along, was to gain control of these cities. Um, he just sat down and talked to him. I mean, how gross, how disgusting. You're supposed to go in there, swords ablazing, and just kill everybody. So uh, Frederick II had a much more, let's say, amicable relationship with the Islamic world than people were comfortable with at the time. So I'm not giving you Frederick II as an example of what everybody was like, but there were people making, I mean, he did go on a crusade. It's not like they were super close buddies or anything like that. But he had at least some respect for the Islamic world. And he did things like found a university where uh, translations into Latin of Islamic texts were, were being taught. So people like Sylvester II, people like Frederick II are bringing knowledge from the Islamic world into Europe during this period. So this is even before, as you can see, the dates are before even the earliest estimates for the Renaissance. But there's a there's at this point a flow into Europe of what they'll come to claim as their ancient heritage. Okay, so uh, here's a map. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the kind of history of these massive empires. The topic for this week, as I said, was uh, science and empire. Um, so this is the uh, Islamic caliphates. Here's sort of a, a few of them, uh, and you can see it goes from 
like on the western end as far as Spain. So this is areas that came under control of uh, sort of Islamic rulers all the way to Afghanistan. So from Spain to Afghanistan, this is an enormous political organization. So uh, Europe is on the south, sort of ringed by the Islamic caliphates. In the west, obviously, there's an ocean that's a bit of a barrier. And in the east and to the north is the Mongolian Empire. So Bala argues that a bunch of texts are going to... So what made the Renaissance in Europe? Yes, the revival of ancient Greek knowledge. Yes, a shakeup from the Black Death. Also, large-scale importations of uh, science and philosophy from the Islamic world and science and philosophy and technology, I mean, from both, but technology seems to be the one that Bala thinks is most important through the Mongolian Empire. So the Mongolian Empire, again, absolutely ginormous political organization. Um, and technology and uh, sort of like high technology, especially relative to what was going on in Europe at the time, is being imported from the Mongolian Empire into Europe. There's a kind of active and on purpose conversation going on between the Mongolians and the Europeans, as well as the Europeans and the Islamic world, and of course, the Islamic world and the Mongolians. So everybody's talking here, everybody's communicating and sharing ideas. And Bala thinks that if you don't get that part of it, you don't really understand what made the made the Renaissance in Europe. Okay, so um, one of the things that the Islamic caliphates and the Mongolian Empire share is a philosophy of empire, of how to run an empire. And I'll just briefly want to tell you about another empire from way, way back. So this is from uh, 500 BC, actually, uh, the Achaemenid Empire. So um, we saw with the Neo-Assyrians a version of this where, do you remember the Ashurbanipal, and he's the guy who like takes over a whole big area and then collects up a bunch of texts from that area of wisdom and knowledge and learning and collects them in the library of Ashurbanipal. So he sets a kind of version of this. The Achaemenids, again, uh, if you've never heard of this, uh, you might have heard of it under the name of the First Persian Empire or the bad guys from the movie 300. Remember the, the monstrous, weird bad guys from the movie 300? I swear to you, they didn't look like that. Um, th that's the Achaemenid Empire. And at its height, it was the biggest political organization in the world and contained about a quarter of the entire human population, as far as we can tell. So this is a really, really big empire. And they organize themselves along a particular, so with a particular strategy you can see in the Neo-Assyrians, and I'd like to argue that you can see in the Islamic Caliphates and the Mongolian Empire as well. And it's something like this, it's a kind of multiculturalism. So the Achaemenids took over, so they, like the Neo-Assyrians, they'd roll up to your town or city or nation state and say, hello, we'd like to be in charge now. And if we don't get that, you might have to die. Um, but if you were willing to accept their rule, you got to keep your culture, your way of dress, your religion. Um, they would remove the leaders and take their money, um, but they would appoint from within the population their own leaders. So your leaders would be somebody who looks like you and talks like you, although they're kind of owned by the Persian Empire. So this is uh, this is Xerxes, uh, the, the bad guy from 300. So they set this pattern of how to run an empire, which is don't crush the people that you're taking over in the sense of forcing them to ex adopt your culture or your religion or your language. Let them keep their basic thing and tax them and like they'll be more willing to accept your rule if you do this. If you try to just totally replace their culture, uh, they'll resist you to the end because then you're erasing who they are. But if you let them have their culture, just pay taxes and behave, um, then they'll be much more happy to accept your rule. So, and the, the model that the Achaemenids set up is, is, them, is themselves as a kind of state of states, right? The uh, Xerxes calls himself the king of kings, right? So 
your local leader gets to be a king still, but this guy's the king of those kings. So this pattern, I want to argue, shows up in very much in the Islamic caliphates in a very conscious way, and the Mongolian Empire, so the Mongolian Empire is likewise highly multicultural. They take over these vast regions, but they don't force people to accept a particular religion or style of dress or culture. So, and what that allows from, for it, it does a lot of things, but for our purposes from the history of science, what that allows is for you to, as the rulers, consolidate all the knowledge and skills and technology that's all over this, your vast new empire and synthesize it and bring it together. And that's what happens in the Islamic caliphates as well as the Mongolian empire. And those massive projects of synthesis then get fed into Europe during the Renaissance. And Bala argues in this chapter, if you're going to understand the Renaissance in Europe, you'd better understand this process, how the, how Europe was being fed the kind of massive collections and synthesis of knowledge coming from these two enormous empires. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to focus in on the, the story leading up to the Islamic caliphates. And next week, I'm going to cover the kind of eastern half of this. So India, China, and the overall kind of like area conquered by the Mongols. Okay, thanks.